Our teaching text this morning comes from Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Let's pray. God, I thank you um, that we get to gather together and hear your word. And I pray for us to remember that you are here, um, that you are not a God that is sitting up above, but you dwell amongst us. Um, so I just pray, Lord, that we would have open hearts to receive your word and to hear what it is that you're going to be teaching through Tim. Um, and so I just pray for this time that we get to be with one another, worshiping in one body collectively. Um, we praise your name for that. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's give it up for Janessa. You got two woos. How are we doing? I, uh, I've been looking forward to this passage for a long time, which means that I just know that I'm going to come in here more excited than you guys are ready for. And so it's okay. I just know that you're going to meet me there in the next two minutes. Okay. So go ahead. I know that it's church and we came in ready to be bored for an hour and a half before brunch, but I'm excited for today. Okay. We good? Can we be excited about God's word and to get to look at it together? Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 is where we're going to be starting out. If you need a Bible, there should be some on the rows. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be hanging out there in that passage Janessa just read for us. Uh, as you're turning there, I want to start this morning with a question. And that question is this, what do you need to be happy? What do you need to be happy? I'll give you a minute, think about it. Maybe you can jot, jot a couple thoughts down on your phone or if you've got the Matthew Scripture Guide with you. What do you need to be happy? In the spring semester of 2018, Yale University launched a course, Psychology 157, Psychology and the Good Life. It became known secondhand around campus as the, quote, how to be happy class. And the class was so popular that within two weeks of releasing it on the registration page, over 1,200 undergraduates, which is about 25% of Yale students, signed up for the class. After two semesters of offering it, the class got so popular, Yale actually put it online for free for the general public to access. And within two years, over three million Americans had decided to go back to college to take this course, the How to Be Happy class, seeking to answer this question that I think all of us are asking, whether consciously or subconsciously. How the heck do I be happy? Like, how, how do I, as a human, get happiness? Like, what are, maybe you'll think about it this way, what are the ingredients for the good and flourishing life? What do I need to finally be happy? We're getting this morning into our journey through Jesus' longest and most famous recorded teaching in the Bible, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, very cleverly titled because it's a sermon on a mount. At the end of chapter four, Jesus, we saw, got done healing, and he's casting out demons, and he's growing in popularity. People from all across the, the different region and different towns, hundreds of miles away, are walking to Jesus to be healed. Beginning of chapter five, though, Jesus sees the crowd, and he's going to kind of pull back, withdraw, and gather closely his disciples, his followers, those who have said yes to following him, and he's going to spell out for them in chapters 5, 6, and 7, and for us, what exactly it means to be a disciple, what exactly it means to be a kingdom follower of Jesus. If you want the summary phrase or statement or sentence for the Sermon on the Mount, it's this, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus's vision for a life 
as his disciple in his kingdom. That's where we're covering over the next 10 weeks. If you're going to enter into and live in the kingdom of God, then this is the type of person that you should become and the types of things you should find yourself doing. And Jesus begins his whole teaching, life in the kingdom of God as a disciple, with his answer to our opening question, how can someone be happy? That's where he starts the whole thing. Here's my vision for life in the kingdom of God, and I want to start with telling you the path to happiness. Look at what he says. Matthew chapter 5, we'll start in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came To him. Now, this is really important. He's speaking to his disciples. The crowd's certainly listening, but the specific people he's talking to are his disciples. So, what he's not going to tell them over the next three chapters is how to become a disciple. If you read the Sermon on the Mount as, here's how I become a Christian, become a follower of Jesus, you are going to be very, very disappointed and very, very sad because Jesus is going to constantly raise the righteousness bar. And it's going to be very clear, very quick, I cannot reach this if this is requirements to get into heaven. Rather, he's calling his disciples, those who have entered his kingdom through kingdom entrance, repentance, saying, here's now how you live. And look at what he says, verse 2. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, blessed. All right, pause there. Let's talk about this word, blessed. So side fun fact note, maybe you've heard this list he's about to get into called the Beatitudes. Beatitudes is just from the Latin translation for the word blessed, which is beatus. So fun fact, there you go. Blessed here is translated from the Greek word makarios, and understanding this word is very, very important. So makarios often is translated blessed, like it is here in the ESV. It's also translated sometimes as fortunate, but I think the best and most simple translation is the word happy. Now, when you hear happy, don't think like a good feeling in your stomach. Like, don't think like the feeling of happiness. Rather think, this is the happy place to be in life. This is the fortunate person. These people Jesus is about to describe are right where all of us want to be. They're the picture of human flourishing. It's the people you'd look at their life and go, ha, must be nice. Or, ooh, if only. Or, okay, good for you. Like, it's these People. That's what the scriptures mean here by the word makarios, by the word blessed. They are the people we look at and go, they are living the good life. Do you have these people in mind? Where you're just like, I'm thinking about their life and it's just right as it should be. In fact, in Jewish tradition, this word makarios was used to mean something like, quote, God is with you. Like based on what I'm seeing in your life, it's clear his kingship, his rule, his reign, his saving gracious presence has come over your life and it's drawing out of you deep, overflowing, exuberant joy and happiness. That's Makarios. That's blessed. That's the type of person Jesus is about to get into. But here's where it gets, in our minds at least, a little bit of that upside down backwardness. Because Jesus is going to make eight statements about the flourishing person. And they, let's just be honest, are not the eight statements we would make. They're very strange if we're willing to kind of take away our, I've read the Bible before glasses and look at them for the first time or in an honest way. What he's going to tell us, these eight characteristics or virtues are not the things we would describe as the fortunate, enviable person. And so I just want to, one at a time, quickly work through each one so we understand exactly what he means. We'll do it quick. First, first person he says is blessed is, quote, the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means embracing daily dependence on God for all that you need. So there are two terms used in the New Testament for the word poor. One term means simply lower class, kind of paycheck to paycheck. You're getting by, you're making it, you're paying your bills, but that's kind of it. Sort of a a lower class understanding of poor. The other word for poor used in the New Testament was when you have absolutely nothing at all. And that's the word Jesus actually uses here. It's the word patokoi. Can you say that? Patokoi? It's an onomatopoeia. Does anybody remember what an onomatopoeia is? It's where the word sounds like the thing, right? And so if you think about the word patokoi, it sounds like you're what? You're spitting, right? And the reason why people were called patokoi is because they were so poor, so dejected, so outcast from society that as people walked along the road and they would kind of just turn to the side and spit, they wouldn't even recognize that person may be there and they would just spit right on them. That's how poor it is to be patokoi. That's what Jesus is describing here is he says, first, the first group of people that are blessed are the patokoi in spirit. 
What does that mean? It's those who finally realize I have nothing of goodness to offer God on my own. I have nothing in my hands to try to prove that I'm worth it and I'm good and he can use me. Look how awesome I am, God. No, we come to God desperately in need of his mercy and grace and the power of our Holy Spirit. Think about Luke 18, Pharisee and the tax collector. This story Jesus tells about how there's two folks that go to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, who's the leading religious leader of the day, and the tax collector, who's the outcasted reject of society. And the Pharisee gets to the temple to pray, and what does he do? He stands up boldly proclaiming, Lord, thank you, I'm not like the rest of these losers. That's the Tim Olson translation. The tax collector, what does he do? He gets to the temple, he can't even raise his head. He just beats his chest, and his prayer is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What does Jesus say? Who goes home forgiven and blessed? The tax collector. Why? Because happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the patokoi, those who say, I am open-handed and desperately in need of God. Second group, he's going to say is blessed are those who mourn. Blessed, happy, fortunate, enviable are those who mourn. What he has in mind here is those who bring their grief and sorrow to God. The biblical word you might hear used for it is lament to lament, to mourn or to lament, to bring your sorrow to God doesn't mean you sugarcoat life or don't worry, be happy or life is good. Just, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and go for it all the time. But also mourning in the scriptures doesn't mean you just sit and whine and gripe and woe is me. Jesus's vision for the good life is a person who takes their grief, takes their mourning, takes the reality of being a broken person living in a broken world to him. Happy is the person who mourns, who grieves in a Godward direction that takes their sorrow that's going to come as a part of life up to God. The third group he mentions is the meek. The meek, happy are the meek. Now, meekness is not a a word we use often, but to be meek means to leverage your power to serve others and not yourself. We would often use the word gentle. And gentleness or meekness is not weakness, rather it's power under control. To be meek means to reject a spirit of arrogance and dominance or me first living and rather use whatever power, authority, or control you have in service to others. Think about Jesus two weeks ago at his baptism, right? Jesus, who is the king of the universe and holds the world together, goes to the waters of baptism to identify with sin and sinners. That's meekness. I'm using the power I have for the good of others. Number four, He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matthew's going to return to this theme of righteousness a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. It means a life in line with God's design, a life God would approve of. And so to hunger and thirst for righteousness means having an eagerness to live as God commands. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness means you don't kick and scream your way into obedience, right? You don't go, ah, I really don't want to obey God, but I guess I have to because like I'm a Christian or like, I really don't like this command, but I guess I just will sort of follow it if I have to, or I wish the Bible said something different so I don't have to go this way. That's not hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for righteousness is to do what the psalmist says in Psalm 19, that the law of the Lord is perfect and our delight and revives our soul. So we look at the commands of God and we don't just go, I guess I'll follow them if I want to. We go, this is right and good and true. And I'm hungering to live as if God calls me to live this way. That's four. It's good so far. That's halfway. No. Okay, great. Number five, merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Being merciful means treating your enemies with kindness and generosity. It's not just forgiveness, although that's certainly a part of it. Mercy means giving folks what they do not deserve. So you wronged me, and instead of wronging me, or instead of choosing bitterness or anger or gossip or payback, I'm choosing to not only forgive, but to bless you, to be kind to you, and to help you in your need. Number six, blessed are the pure in heart. We taught before, heart in the Greek is not the place where you feel things or the place in your body that pumps oxygen and blood. That's what a heart does, right? Those are great ways. That's the heart, but that's not how the Greeks talk about the heart. The heart in the Bible is the operating system of your life. It's your loves. It's your desires. It's the aiming goal of who you are. So to be pure in heart, according to Jesus, means that the operating center, the core of your being is aimed at God and his kingdom. It's Matthew chapter six. What does Jesus say, right? Seek first the what? Kingdom of God. That's what it means to be pure in heart. Or in the words of philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, to be pure in heart is to will the one thing. More than anything else in my life, I want the kingdom of God to come to bear 
in my life and in my body. So say with David in Psalm 27, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Number seven, two more. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are those who are willing to fight for wholeness and harmony in all aspects of life. So it's worth noting here, Jesus doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. We love peacekeepers in our society. Jesus says, no, blessed are the peacemakers. And here's the difference. If your coworkers are all gossiping about your boss, peacekeeping goes, well, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend them. So I'm just going to let them live in the chaos of that reality. Peacemaking says, I'm willing to offend some folks to say the hard truth to actually bring real flourishing to this situation. Peacekeeping is my friend's about to destroy and blow up their life, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want them to get mad at me and I don't want to hurt our relationship. Peacemaking is I'm going to be willing to add some chaos into the situation by saying the hard things such that they actually might repent and change. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, those who are willing to bring in a little bit of trouble for the sake of the greater shalom, the greater good. And here's the last one, number eight. Blessed are those who are persecuted and reviled for righteousness' sake. Now, you might notice 10 and 11 are two blessed statements. Most scholars actually put them together, which is why we're putting them together. I like to agree with most people who are smarter than me. It just works most of the time. It says, blessed are those, verse 10, we'll just look at it real quick. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he kind of repeats himself in 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So here's what he's saying. Blessed are those who value being right with God even when it costs them. Blessed are those who are persecuted, reviled, slandered, made fun of, left out of plans, rejected as a friend, etc., because they are trying to follow Jesus. Not because they're jerks, not because they're mean, not because they made a bad decision. Rather, blessed are those who suffer for the sake of following the kingdom of God. So that's the eight. All right, we're feeling happy? Everybody feeling blessed? <laughs> It's Jesus' vision for a happy, blessed, flourishing, enviable, right where you want to be in the kingdom of God type of life. I mean, look at this list. This seems ridiculous, right? Poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Number eight, those who are persecuted and reviled and slandered for righteousness' sake. Jesus says those are the virtues, those are the traits, those are the characteristics of how to be happy. You want to be happy? Be willing to be meek, hungry, and mocked. Now, I think if we're being honest, our response to that list is like, really? Like, really, Jesus? Like, I don't know if I agree. I I don't know if I agree. You're like, this is what you do for a living. I don't know if I agree, right? Like, this list sounds much more like cosmic killjoy than path to flourishing and exuberant happiness. Dr. Jonathan Pennington writes in his fantastic commentary on the sermon. He says, what Jesus proclaims as being a state of flourishing includes many things that humanity naturally and even vehemently seeks to avoid. Like this is not our list if we were writing it. Like if we made a list of American Beatitudes, I think it would sound much different than Jesus. I mean, think about how you answered the question at the beginning of today's teaching. What do you need to be happy? What did you say? More friends? A group to belong to? Better friends? More money? some level of material comfort or certainty, more control over the chaos of life and the uncertainty of the future. No, more independence, more freedom, more autonomy, more ability to do what I want when I want. No, I need more healing from my past, more self-worth, more positive self-esteem. Or maybe you were like, no, nah, we're in church. I knew the answer. I, I thought Jesus. All right, good for you, gold star. But did you think mourning? Like, did you think purity of heart? Did you think poor, patokoi in spirit? Like, let's be honest about what our list actually looks like. I think if Americans put together our own list of beatitudes, it would sound much more like this. If we were to write down our own list, start our own sermon on the mount, it would say this, blessed are the rich, for they have nothing to worry about. Blessed are you when you accept yourself, for you will find inner peace. Or blessed are the sexually and romantically fulfilled, for there is no greater path to joy. Blessed are those who believe in themselves, for they will accomplish their goals. Blessed are the influencers, for they have everyone's approval. Blessed are those who are rising in their careers, for then they will finally find lasting contentment. Blessed are the independent and those who don't need anything, for they will never be disappointed 
or let down. And then along comes Jesus, who basically says the exact opposite of all of that. And the problem is, even if we love him, it's really hard for us to believe him. Like, I mean, think about the last time you asked a CG member or a close friend, how are you? And they said, I'm sad. I'm just, I'm down and out. I'm just, I'm feeling really depressed. Chances are your response and the ensuing conversation was about what's going wrong in their life, right? Like if you sit down with a friend over coffee and they're like, I'm just sad. You're probably like, okay, what's the problem at work? What's the problem at home? What's the problem with the kids? What's the problem with the family? What's the problem with your health? Like what is going on? And listen to me, those are not bad things to address. Those are certainly not bad questions to ask, but chances are your response was not, oh, you're not happy? Is it because you're not living a pure in heart life solely devoted to the kingdom of God? Oh, you're not happy? Is it because you're not persecuted enough for righteousness sake? Oh, you're not happy? Is it because maybe you're not being a person of meekness and you're leveraging your strength not to help others, but to help yourself? And even me asking, have you ever thought about those questions? All of us are go, that's really insensitive. Like, that's pretty messed up, kind of weird, pretty rude. I'm never going to Tim if I feel sad. Right? Not in America. My happiness is never a problem in here in America. Maybe it's a little bit of a problem in here, but it's mostly a problem out here. It's my circumstances. We think this, right? If I could just fix blank, then I would be happy. If I could just get that next Promotion, then I would be happy, even though I thought that about the last four. If I could just finally get the better house, then I'd be happy, even though I thought that about the last apartment I moved into. If I could just find the right relationship, then I could be happy. If I could just fix that thing about my spouse, that's the one thing, not to mention the other 10 things that were the one thing, but this is the one thing, then I could be happy. It's always external. And I think it's just worth asking, so we even think about the list of American Beatitudes. I think it's just worth considering, is it working? you happy? Am I happy? Are any of us happy? Or do most of us wake up most mornings with a pretty low-grade depression asking, is this all there is? And so maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe Jesus isn't crazy because maybe we see we've tried all of it and it's just not working. America, for all of our advancements in technology and medicine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are all good things. I'm not saying those are bad things, but for a lot of those good things, we just don't seem like we're any happier. And so what is Jesus getting at? Like, what's the problem? Like, why is this happiness? Why is this the blessed person? Well, I think it's because you got to read the second half of every statement, which I left off intentionally. Because Jesus is going to connect the blessedness of the first part with the promise that comes in the second part. He connects it. In the ESV, it's the word for. I think it's the word hoti. I think it's better translated as because. It's just easier to kind of grab the connections he's making. And so just look, look back at Matthew 5 with me. I just want to show you the promises that Jesus gives. Verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, who bring their grief to God. Why? Because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, those who leverage their power for the good of others, because they shall inherit the earth. That is when Jesus returns, they shall get the inheritance with him that he has promised of a new heavens and a new earth. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who want in the deep recesses of their heart to do the will of God. Why? Because they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, those who not just forgive their enemies, but love them and serve them and care for them. Why? Because they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who long for one thing, the kingdom of God. Why? Because they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who are willing to have a little bit of conflict for the greater shalom and good. Why? Because they shall be called sons or children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see what Jesus is trying to say? What he's saying actually really well. Here's the big truth I need us to understand this morning. According to Jesus, happiness is not found in circumstances. It is found in God. According to Jesus, happiness that's lasting, the blessed, flourishing place to be is found in God. All of these promises are promises about getting more of God. Do you see that? 
So notice this, a disciple in the kingdom of God is poor in spirit, desperately needy and unable to do life on their own. And we think that sounds awful. I want to be independent and self-made and got it going on. I don't want to be weak. I want to be tough. And Jesus says, no, Patokoi in spirit is the happy place to be because when you finally come to the kingdom open-handed, you're ready to receive it. Jesus says a disciple in the kingdom of God knows how to mourn and bring their grief to God. And we think, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just whine and complain or stuff it all down. And Jesus says, no, it's the happy place to be. Don't you see when you finally bring your grief to me, that's when I can actually comfort you? Jesus says a disciple in the kingdom of God is merciful to others. And we think, I don't want to be merciful. I want to be bitter and resentful and gossip and be angry. And Jesus says, no, mercy is the happy place. Because when you show mercy, you finally understand in new, flourishing, beautiful ways how merciful I've been to you. And Jesus says a disciple in the kingdom of God is pure in heart. And we think, I don't want to be pure in heart. I want to follow my own heart. I don't want to focus on the kingdom of God. I want to focus on my own kingdom. I want to establish my own life and my own family and my own career. And then I'll worry about the Jesus stuff. And Jesus says, no, purity in heart is the happy place. Because when you're pure in heart, and this is the one I've been so fixated on this week, you get to see God. I mean, I want to see God. (laughs) I want to see the unseeable work his might and beauty and power in my life. Jesus says, pure in heart. Jesus says a disciple in the kingdom of God is persecuted and reviled and slandered and belittled for following me. And we think, no, thank you. I like when people like me. It's a very human thing to want, right, Jesus? And Jesus says, no, persecution is the happy place because your reward is great in eternity. Jesus shows us the path to becoming a happy person in his kingdom because the other side of it is more of God. And so, of course, that's the happy place to be, right? Like, of course, when we understand the upside down kingdom and we read the first half of the list, it's like, this sounds weird. And then we read the second half and go, this makes total sense, Jesus, because I get God. And that's where happiness is found. And if you know anything about Jesus and his life, then it makes a whole lot of sense when you consider what he's teaching and how he lived. Right? Because Jesus, who says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, was deeply acquainted with mourning and grief. Jesus, who says, blessed are the meek, was very meek. He held the universe together, and yet he goes to the cross on his own volition to die for sin and sinners. Jesus, who says, blessed are the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, literally says in John 4, my food is to do the will of God the Father. Jesus, who says, blessed are the merciful, was constantly kind to sinners and ate with those who society rejected and asked even on the cross, God, forgive those who are murdering me for they know not what they do. And so here's Jesus laying out before all who would follow him, would you believe my kingdom way is the path to flourishing? Would you believe the very path I walked for you to bring you into the kingdom and the path I now lay before you as a disciple who longs to follow me is actually the one that leads to your greatest happiness and joy? This is where happiness is found because this is where God is found. And I love that he starts the sermon this way because there's this idea throughout history that has only grown in my lifetime that Jesus is the cosmic killjoy, right? It's like, I'm going to sign up to follow him after I have my fun, after I get my happiness, after I figure out what makes me happy. Jesus says, no, I've got the keys to all of life, not just the Christian side of life, but all of life. And this is how it's meant to be lived. If you don't trust him, if you don't believe that, then the rest of the sermon is going to be really hard when he tells you to do things like cut your eye out if it causes you to sin, which is not literal. We'll get into it. Or forgive your enemies or trust him with your finances. It starts by believing he's actually good and he's trustworthy and he's true and he's walked the very path he calls us now to walk. It's for our flourishing and it's for our happiness. And so let me close with this. Now, Pastor Rich Viotis, in his recent book on the Sermon on the Mount, The Narrow Path, which I would highly recommend to you, The Narrow Path, he says the sermon uh, functions as both invitation and inventory. Invitation and inventory. I think that's really helpful language. So the sermon, the next three chapters we're going to look at is an invitation to a whole new way of living, a whole new way of being human as a part of the kingdom of God. But it's also, inven- it's also uh, sorry, inventory, a chance to honestly assess and ask whether our lives align with Jesus' teaching about what a kingdom life should look like. And so just briefly as we close, I just want to do those two things for us. First is I want to take inventory of our lives. So um, Drew, if you would put those eight statements back up. I'm curious how much your life matches up with the eight blessed statements Jesus makes in Matthew 5. 
Like chances are, if you're willing to be honest and like me, you're starting to already see a disconnect between Jesus's vision for discipleship and how we actually live and how we actually function and what we actually value. And just to warn you, if you're willing to be honest over the next 10 weeks as we journey through the Sermon on the Mount together, uh, this is going to happen a lot. Like if you're open to the work of the Holy Spirit, then you should walk out of most of the teachings going, this is not an alignment. God, how do I need to repent and what do I need to shift to walk your kingdom ways? And some of it should be painful because conviction can be the best type of pain. I love this. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the famous author, Chronicles of Narnia, Great Divorce, some other things. Uh, he was asked one time by one of his students, uh, why do you not like the Sermon on the Mount all that much? Like they were like, it seems like you're kind of down on it. You kind of poke fun at it. Like, why don't you care for the Sermon on the Mount? And I love this from C.S. Lewis. And I think uh, it's going to come back a lot in the series. But he says this. He says, as to caring for the Sermon on the Mount, if caring for here means liking or enjoying, I suppose no one cares for it. Who can like being knocked flat on the face by a sledgehammer? <laughs> we were in TG Team this week, and one of the folks was referring to this quote, and they were like, who likes being ice picked to the face? And that just sounds even worse than he was saying. But then notice what he says, I can hardly imagine a more deadly spiritual condition than that of a man who can read the sermon with tranquil pleasure. Like, if you can read the list of eight blessed statements and walk away going, I'm doing pretty well then C.S. Lewis and myself and Jesus would probably be more concerned about the state of your soul. Then if you're walking out going, I don't know that I believe this and this sounds really hard, I think you're more in line with the Holy Spirit doing the work he wants to do. And we're going to see that time and time again in the sermon. And so praise God for his mercy and grace. Jesus is going to say in two weeks, we're going to see it in chapter 5, 17 through 20, that I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And what he means is that I've come as the one who can hold the righteous standard I'm laying before you and praise God for his mercy and grace that that righteousness of Jesus gets credited to us as our righteousness through faith. And so one day when you stand before the Lord and he says, why should I let you into my kingdom forever? You're not going to claim your ability to follow these three chapters. If you do, that's bad news. Don't do it. So we're going to claim Christ and his ability to follow these chapters and so much more to live as our righteousness and yet to die the death we deserve. And yet, even in the midst of his mercy and grace, he now invites us, okay, in light of that reality, come follow me in the ways I've laid out. Come be a Sermon on the Mount kind of people. So take an inventory this week. That's the invitation. In what ways are these beatitudes not present in your life? And then second, use the gaps the Holy Spirit shows you as an invitation further into his kingdom ways. All right, we talk about this all the time. How do people change? teaching, community, and practice. You cannot think your way into the Beatitudes. You cannot desire your way into the Beatitudes. You have to live your way into the Beatitudes. So what does that look like this week to cultivate these things in your everyday life, to cultivate a heart that is poor in spirit? Maybe this looks like the practice of examine. Okay, every night I'm going to get before the Lord in prayer and saying, Lord, show me the ways that I've gone against your kingdom purposes today and teach me how desperately I still need you in the Holy Spirit. Well, if you to cultivate meekness, using your power for the good of others. Maybe this week, you're like, I'm not a meek person. I use my power for me. Maybe this week, it'd be a great practice to do one or two things in sacrificial service to somebody else. Hey, I'm going to let that coworker go first. I'm going to serve that friend. I'm going to use whatever power or autonomy or authority God has given me in my life to bless somebody else. What about mercy? What would it look like for you to send that text or get that coffee or begin to work on that reconciling that broken relationship? Here's what Jesus promises. This is hard work and it's scary work, but here's what he promises. There's happiness in this kingdom way of living because there's God in this kingdom way of living. If you think nothing else as you're walking out of Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, as you read it again over years of following Jesus, or as you think about it this week in your groups, see that, the promise that you get more of God when you believe the way Jesus invites us to live. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We need you. I want to thank you for the Sermon on the Mount. God, I pray that over the next 10 weeks as we journey through this together, you would convict us like only you can. You would help us take inventory and stock of our life like only you and the power of your Holy Spirit can, Lord, that we would not read it like C.S. Lewis warns as people with tranquil hearts of pleasure. That you would show us all the ways that your standard of righteousness is greater than our ability to live into it. And that you would help us see the good news of Christ in the midst of that. And you would help call us into deeper levels of obedience and righteousness and holiness. So Lord, help us. We need your help. We're not naturally a Sermon on the Mount type of people. Lord, we don't think in our everyday life this is what we need to be happy, Lord. And so I pray you would help us. You would shift our perspective. You would help us embrace the upside-down kingdom that we would be 
a people who bring our grief to you, a people who are poor in spirit, a people who are merciful and peacemakers and all the things you invite us to, Lord, that we would just believe you, that you're for our good and our happiness and our joy in you, even if it feels like a different path to get there than we want it to be. And so help us, Lord. Help us to love you more. Help us to care about the things of your kingdom. For all these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said,